Uh, I just, I just, I'll, I'll keep the people nameless, but uh, I was watching you uh, on Fox Business this morning discussing the jobs number, and it was incredible how nobody had any idea whether it was going to be higher or lower. But afterwards, all the experts said, "Well, of course it would increase double." I, I knew it was. <laughs> Everybody's got 50-50 hindsight after the numbers announced. Yeah, which was a complete shock, by the way. It was supposed yes. to come in a lot lighter than that. And then it's like, oh, my gosh, let's let's spin this negatively that there's so many more jobs created in the country, which blows my mind. Like, it's never a bad thing when more Americans have jobs. You know, <laughs> like it should be economics 101. It must be exhausted to be one of these pundits and every week to have to take great data and make it negative. Like, I wonder how much time they actually spend doing that. I think all the time, Chris. I mean, it's uh, again, remember, if you're if you're optimistic and you're and you're even Pollyannish in your view if you're, you know, if you believe in the efficacy of the market and the economy and how good the numbers are, well, you know, then you're probably trying to sell me something. But if you're <laughs> pessimistic, right, and you're negative, then you sound more intelligent and all you're trying to do is help me as an investor, right? <laughs> I've been having a lot of these what I call yes but calls with clients. So, you know, I talk to people and I say like, oh, here, you know, here's all the great things that are happening. And then it gets followed up by yes but. Have you considered this? Yes, but we're probably going to recession. Well, here's the thing. You know, you look at the market um, and obviously it's reacting to the chances that interest rates could go higher, right? We hit a 4.8% treasury. And I don't think it was just so much that the 10-year yields at 4.8%. I think it was just that in July, it was 38 So it was just the velocity of the increase was kind of shocked the system, shocked investors. But again, if you look at the economy strong, GDP number is going to be really good. Earnings should be unbelievable. Then all you're really getting is a price adjustment, guys. Everything adjusts to higher interest rates. You have to adjust the prices. Yeah. And boy, do they adjust, right? I mean, like almost a 10% sell off in the S&P 500 like that, um, which is scary. And I get that. Um, but it is also normal. I'd mentioned like if you look at most years, you typically get a 10% correction in stocks. And if you go back to last October when the market bottomed out, I mean, the market had a magnificent 25% move. Uh, so obviously, at some point, you are going to get a sell-off. And I think that's what you're seeing here is maybe some profit-taking in there. To your point, Bob, interest rates going higher has spooked the market. But I also mentioned having 4.5-5% interest rates is historically very normal. We're just getting back to normal. We're in very abnormal times, especially over the pandemic. You know, I was talking to a client of mine last week, and... Um... You know, we, we had talked about this before where the bad times seem like they last longer than the good times. And I brought up to them that, you know, we had a down year in 2018. We had a, you know, almost a 40 percent downturn during the pandemic of 2020. And the funny thing about it was he didn't remember any of it. <laughs> well, it's like the weather. People have a very, very short term memory. Um, and it's easy. It's easy to get skewed negatively when you get markets selling off. Right. The pundits are telling you that we got a big problem, which, you know, the deficit is a big problem. I don't want to discount that. Uh, we spent another $2 trillion more over the last 12 months. And, you know, I think that's what the bond market's telling you. Enough's enough, government. Like, you have to stop. You have to curtail the spending. I think it is a big wake-up call and because I think Americans in general are more attuned to the fact that when the government's spending lots of money, it actually costs you a lot in that hidden insidious tax, Bob, that you like to call inflation. Well, inflation is the biggest risk to everybody's financial plan. That's why you have to own equities. I mean, it's so tempting here. You know, to just put all your money into a three-month T-bill at 5.5% or six-month T-bill at 5.5% sounds really good, except for the historical rate of return on equities is double. And most of us need an equity-like return to overcome inflation to achieve our financial goals. So if you look at past periods where we've had, you know, the uh, cycle of interest rates increasing, at the end of the cycle, when the six-month CD or Treasury yield peaks, you get a subsequent gigantic rally – in almost everything. And, you know, the only time it didn't happen with 2000, that's because the tech bubble burst and all those debt dot com stocks, which were, you know, selling at ridiculous multiples, you know, collapsed. But you got to look forward. You can't be thinking, oh, here and now, this is such a great idea. Well, you know, it's a good point, Dad. And I think, you know, we, we always talk about how investing is a is a long range view. And I would tell people, put down your reading glasses, pick up your binoculars. You know, there's always hope on the horizon. Yeah, there really is. And I mean, again, you start, Bob already mentioned, like you start looking at some of the data, like, you know, earnings this quarter should be pretty good. They're actually going to turn positive after several negative quarters. And, you know, we point out this a lot. No one talks about it. But earnings growth next year is going to be double digits, like 10, 11 percent. And that's the consensus from all the analysts out there in Wall Street. That's not our consensus. Um, and even maybe even out into 2024, if you want to extrapolate out that far. 
And we know at the end of the day, stocks are beholden to earnings and the earnings picture looks pretty good. So like there's a lot to be optimistic about right now. And that news really isn't filtering through. Well, Chris, I really liked your observation from your client. You know, when you went through and explained the recent history of the volatility of the financial markets and they had no memory of it. Of course, if you go through something very painful, you know, your mind forgets, right? It gives you like, uh, you know, amnesia, you know, not to forget to remember such a painful event. But, you know, we were at 18,000, right, when uh, when COVID hit on the Dow. And now we just had this horrific 8% correction, you know, in the S&P and we're at 33,000, right? Uh, we're not at 18,000, we're at 33,000. The market's made tremendous progress. And based on these earnings estimates you're talking about, Rye, if you just take the same valuation that the market trades at historically, we're looking at 40 to 43,000 on the Dow. So, you know, if you're looking at your portfolio and you're worried about the volatility of the markets, I would say there's a higher probability that in two years we'll be at 43,000 or 40,000 on the Dow than we will be at 18,000, which was just the other day, by the way. Yeah, it's like oh, we want to win the war, not the battle, because that's like a 15% plus return. And if you're allocating capital right now, it's like, okay, if I sit in cash at 5%, good chance the Fed cuts next year, my five goes to 3%. Meanwhile, you can lock into a longer term bond portfolio at these high, high interest rates, you know, 16 year high, and you can buy the market, which Based on that math, Bob, you know, you're talking about a pretty nice return over the course of the next 24 months. It's time to buy bonds. It's time to buy stocks. It's not the time to sit in cash unless that's money you actually need. If not, get it invested. Yeah, but cash is so comforting, right? My statement never goes down. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great point that it is comforting. And I think a lot of our clients and the investing public at large would, would say the same thing. But, you know, if you go back and look over the last 10 years, say, OK, if I had my money in cash, you know, where would I be today? If I had my money in all bonds, where would I be today? Or if I had my money in all stocks, where would I be today? And I think, you know, if you look at cash versus where how people were invested, I think it's agreed here that the returns would be substantially lower. You're always destroying great emotional points with facts. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some smart guy told me that he had charts and yeah. graphs to back him up. So, yeah. you know, I think that's always a good, a good way to look at things. Yeah. I personally just want to invest with my emotions and my vibe. That's it. <laughs> just to make all, how I feel today is how I want to invest. But I mean, and honestly, I mean, that's how people invest. And I think that's what you really have to focus on right now. To your point, Chris, is like that long term picture. You got to keep your eye on the prize. And keeping your eye on the prize is things aren't going to be that bad moving forward. Inflation most likely is going to continue to moderate, right? We saw oil prices plummet this last week, which is great. You know, that's disinflationary. And we know those shelter costs and that inflation number, they're going to start to come down drastically too. And meanwhile, we saw it in the jobs report, you know, wages are going to stay strong. Employment is strong. Um, I know people are hurting out there with food costs and oil costs up right now. But the, the bottom line is if that continues to moderate um, and wages do continue to stay up, well, that's not a bad combination. Yeah, and that's, what, that's the problem with the media, right? They focus on certain things. Like this morning, uh, one of the folks who was on that uh, panel Right, that you were on, spoke about, oh, the, uh, the employment numbers are going to be really low because all these workers are going on strike and there's people leaving their jobs, where it turned out to be absolutely the opposite of that, right? We had the, a double of the estimates. So, you know, when they talk about, let's talk about unions, right? Unions are only like 6% of the uh, private workforce today. So, yeah, they're going to probably demand some some increase in wages, which will, you know, be, re and it'll be reflected in other industries, but it's not as dire as the outlook as they make all the time. No, in all fairness, I mean, union people have gotten less raises than non-union people over the last couple of years, so they have to play catch up. So that's why you're seeing all these strikes. And that's also a sign of a tight labor market, right? You wouldn't have a lot of these workers striking right now if they didn't know they had leverage. And they do have leverage because the economy is relatively strong. Uh, job market's pretty tight. So companies need to pay more. And I mean, they, overall, that's not a bad thing. Well, you, you know, what? I was talking to Keith Tesla, our, uh, you know, our IT guy. We had him on the podcast a few weeks ago, and he just hired somebody after looking for somebody for months. And I said, well, have you, are you paying him a premium? He said, yeah. He said, but the thing is, he's like, I've got business, more business than I can handle. You know, we're more profitable than ever. You know, it's worth it to pay those extra wages just because we're doing so well. And, and that's why investing so hard, Chris, and, and everything's so counterintuitive, right? We may end up with the best quarter in earnings in the history of the country. And the market's going down right now, right? So, you know, I always say stocks are the slaves of earnings, of profits. So eventually, you know, it's going to be reflected, right? What Benjamin Graham always said, you know, in the short term, it's a voting machine. In the long term, the market is a weighing machine. That's what it weighs, weighs profits, you know, versus uncertainty. 
So the market does abhor uncertainty. There are a few things that we're concerned about, right? There's the deficit, there's interest rates, right? So there's, you know, there's a, there's a political campaign that's going to bombard us for the next two years. I can't wait for that. Love political commercials. Uh, so, you know, but the, the trend is your friend and, and the trend is, is to the upside, you know, it always has been. And these are times, you know, as I say in, in the past, you make all your money in bear markets. And what does that mean? It means when the market goes down is when you get your best buying opportunities. So don't be shy. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 136, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars and you want a more hands-on approach, a full holistic review, all you need to do is go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a full review where we will look at everything. We literally build you your own personalized financial portal. There's no other firm out there that will do this work up front. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial picture and just hone in on every financial issue you need to address today, whether it's an income plan for retirement. How do you take Social Security? How do you draw from your portfolio without running out of money? Is it diversification? Has your portfolio been like a yo-yo the last two years as markets have been all over the place? Or have you been sitting in cash paralysis by analysis trying to figure out what to do We'll put together a full investment game plan, tie it to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products like annuities, insurance products, mutual funds, brokerage products, structured products. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own, show you where all the hidden costs are, show you how to reduce that cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's now what you make. It's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. Simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. Hey, this is the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. That's P-A-Y-N-E. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And we've got a very special guest on the show today. We have Mariana Molliver. She is a super lawyer as voted by Super Lawyer Magazine in the areas of estate planning and probate. We work with her. She has a lot of great insights. She has her own practice into the world of estate planning, which we get a lot of questions on. Mariana, great to have you on the show today. Really appreciate you taking the time. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And I feel like no one likes to do estate planning, with all due respect. <laughs> it's like, you know, everyone tries to avoid it like the plague, but we know it's extremely important and I'm just curious in your practice, like what are some of the biggest mistakes people make when it comes to their estate plan or, you know, they should be thinking about that they just don't do that they need to do? Well, as you yourself said just now, I would say the biggest mistake is not doing it. And I see that very often people pushing it and pushing it. And I'm sorry to say, sometimes they push for too long. And I get clients that come in and say, oh, I need to do this for my mom. And it's too late because mom has lost capacity or, you know, the really tragic situation where someone dies unexpectedly and they don't have their affairs in order and they've left their loved ones a complete mess. So I think the biggest mistake is actually just avoiding it. Um, and, you know, that means go to a lawyer, sit down, discuss it, whatever the goals or concerns may be, they can be addressed. Um, the other mistake is that people sometimes don't want to do it because they're not sure about the choices they have to make. And again, when you sit down and you discuss it, hopefully you will get there in a conversation. Well, I'll play devil's advocate because I get a lot of people to say, well, can I just go online? Because obviously estate planning, it does cost something. You know, you're not, you're not, you're not the Red Cross yet, rumor has it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I'll have people say to me, like, literally, can I just go online for like 300 bucks and set up a will and I'll be good? I feel like that's not the best way. Um, but you can tell me differently. What are some of the, the issues with doing it that way? Or maybe that is the right way. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so obviously I made a, an assumption in the previous answer that you will go to a lawyer. And you're right. There are services, very inexpensive ones out there available. I would say that there's nothing inherently wrong with those services or how they function. The issue often becomes uh, with how clients sign those documents if you have a will, for example, uh, that's been uh, done correctly, the content is what the client wants, and let's just assume all the legalities inside the document are followed, but at the end, the document is not executed correctly with the correct formalities, with the right people involved, that could invalidate the entire document. 
So I think that's one of the biggest pitfalls I see. People coming to me saying, oh, my aunt did this on her own because she was trying to save a couple of shekels. And in the end, we're, sa we're spending, you know, five times what she would have spent just to try to probate a will that was not executed correctly. So that's kind of the biggest pitfall, I think. The other one is that, um, you know, greatest technology is it just doesn't take the place of talking to a professional who can see nuances, who can make recommendations based on experience. Um, you know, very often clients come to me and they may start out by saying, I want X. But as we talk and as I get to know them, I'll say, well, actually, the issue is why. So you're looking at the wrong thing or we're focusing on the wrong thing here. Let's take a step back and look at these other issues that are an even bigger deal. So when you do it online, you know, the technology is never going to say to you, hey, you didn't tell me about this important piece of information that we need to focus on. So I would say that's the other biggest pitfall. You know, I think the biggest frustration that I hear from my wealthy clients especially, is Washington keeps changing the rules. You know, it's like, why do I want to do an estate plan when they're going to change the rules? Or why do I want to do an estate plan when I'm, I'm covered now for $25 million? What's the difference? That's very true at the moment. Um, we do have a very generous estate tax situation right now, and we have had for a couple of years. Um, as you alluded to, uh, the concept is the state tax exemption. That's how much an individual is allowed to pass free of a state tax, either during life or a death or the combination thereof. Um, at the moment, that amount is unusually high. We're at almost 13 million per individual. However, it hasn't always been that high. And this current statute is set to sunset at the end of 2025, which means we will revert to the lower numbers we had before the law came into effect in 2017. Uh, index for inflation, it'll be somewhere between six and seven million per person. Uh, so, you know, not nothing, but certainly not the whopping 13 per person that we have now, almost 13 per person. So um, I would say, you know, even if someone doesn't have a reason to plan right now, they may by 2026. So that's one reason to tackle it. Um, the other reason to tackle it is that assets do appreciate over time. And the faster that you get it out of your estate, the more you gain because the advantage of the appreciation will also, sorry, the appreciation will also be out of your estate and will be uh, probably in the trust that we set up or in the hands of someone else that you've gifted it to. Uh, so I think, you know, between the fact that the numbers will change to most likely much lower number, um, and the fact that the appreciation keeps going, it does make sense to, I think, you know, not postpone, not delay, and handle it now. That probably brings up another question. I mean, obviously, when there's a, a law change or a sunset provision in the estate plan, um, you want to have your estate plan reviewed. But how often just should someone review an estate plan? It's a great question. I get that one all the time from my clients. So the recommendation I give to my clients when we finish their documents and sign them is to look at them at least every five years, but sooner if there is a big life event. So uh, if there is a financial event, both good or bad, um, if there is a, you know, a birth, a death, if the people in your documents have changed, meaning you, know, you have certain executors in place and you have had a falling out with those people, or you just no longer trust them, or they've had a health situation. So those types of changes certainly necessitate revisiting your documents sooner than five years. So I would say that, you know, it's five years, but sooner if there is some reason to, to revisit the documents sooner. And even though that answer is vague, that's another place that the individual comes in. I tell my clients, call me if something has changed and you're not sure if it affects your documents or not give me a call because it may or may not. Uh, you know, for example, I try to draft my documents in a flexible way. So if another child is born, my clients don't necessarily have to run to me and update their documents, right? But other types of changes do, uh, do force us to make quick changes. So I do say, give me a call. I'm not going to charge you for that call. Uh, let's discuss what the changes are and we'll go from there. We have a lot of clients uh -huh. that live in the Northeast and they're, 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 
obviously migrating to Florida and becoming Florida residents. Um, should, you, should you have your estate plan updated if you're no longer a resident of, say, the state of New York or the state of New Jersey, and now a, a state resident of uh, Florida or Texas or you know, some other low-tax state or no-tax state? Yes, the answer is always yes, because uh, a lot of these laws are state specific. So, you know, for example, the estate tax I mentioned is a federal estate tax, but every state has their own estate tax scheme. Some states levy an estate tax, other ones don't. Um, and there are also a lot of other rules that are state specific. So when we do estate planning documents, it's always for the state where you're a resident. And if you permanently move to another state, it's a good idea to revisit it. Now, it's not an emergency in the sense that your documents are still valid. So if you move to Florida and you have your New York will, your New York will is valid and it should be accepted in Florida um, by a Florida court. However, it may not function as effectively. Um, the recommendation may be different. And an example I just gave in Florida, uh, it's recommended to avoid probate, especially because it's so bad there, and to not have a will, but to have a revocable trust instead. That recommendation may not hold in another state. For example, in New Jersey, probate is not considered to be very bad. It's not an arduous process that we try to avoid at all costs. So it really does depend on each state, and that's why after you've moved, it's good to revisit it, but it's not something that you have to do on day one in the sense that your documents don't become invalid. Other states have to accept your validly executed documents. Yeah, that's a good point. And I find this because New York uh, is one of those states where living trust is recommended because the probate process here isn't great. Um, do you find, like, what are what are some of just the basics? If you're someone who lives in the Northeast, um, let's just call it New York. Um, it could be New Jersey as well. What are just the basic documents like everyone needs to have in your opinion? Just something just to make sure you have the basics covered, essentially. So the very basics would include a last will and testament, a power of attorney, healthcare proxy, and living will. Um, now those are the bare minimum. And like you mentioned, it may not be the recommendation for every client. And it really does depend on where you are. And funny enough, even the county, because New York is a big state and upstate is not the same as downstate. And, you know, if someone lives in Queens, that situation may be very different from Orange County. So, um, you know, a lawyer would know that again. So when someone comes to me and they say, oh, you know, my aunt lives in Queens, I would say, oh, we should definitely avoid probate at all costs because I know the Queens courts are so bogged down and so slow. Uh, so by and large, in New York City, I would say in the, the boroughs in New York City, we do try to avoid having to go to probate. And just to you know, go back a step, so probate is what is required when someone passes away with a last will and testament. The will says what the person wishes, but those wishes can't be put into action until a court has reviewed the will and confirmed it. And that process is called probate. So once the court has done that, they appoint the executor under the will, and only then can the executor start to do what the will instructs him or her to do. If we want to avoid that process, if we want to avoid going to court, then we need to do the next level of planning, which is a revocable living trust. And, you know, I don't say that everyone needs it. It's not a basic, but depending on where you are, it's definitely recommended. So what you're saying is the people that run the DMV might not do a great job with processing your estate. I will not speak <laughs> ill of the wonderful people who work in the courts <laughs> near <laughs> retribution, <laughs> but I will say that New York City is bogged down. They are working on a big backlog and uh, it's, yeah. uh, it's difficult and uh, it's a long process to get anything done in the probate courts in New York City. You know, I find that a lot of people have the and a lot of their net worth tied up in their homes, whether it's their primary residence or their, you know, their vacation home. Um, but there's a lot of pushback in getting that out of the estate, right? It's like it's, it's pretty uncomfortable. I mean, what, what, what do you find most people do in that situation? What do you recommend? Yeah, uh, it's difficult to get a primary residence out of your estate in the sense that, and you didn't say this, but in the sense that we would be giving it to an irrevocable trust or to another person, right? 
um, the difficulty there is the person typically wants to keep residing in their home. So if the client wants to keep living in it, and if the client wants to keep treating it as his or her own home, then you really can't get it out of your estate. The concept of getting something out of your estate is, is tricky because it means you're giving up control and access to that asset. And most people can't do that with their primary residence um, because um, you know it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It's a conflict, right? So sometimes we can do that with a vacation home, but even then, if you put your vacation home into an irrevocable trust, you actually should be paying rent to your trust for using said home. And if you don't pay rent and you're ever audited, the IRS can impute the rent. Say, well, you gave it away, so it's not yours. You really should not be using it for free. Um, therefore, we will impute rent that you should have been paying all along. Um, so it is difficult, I would say, to get your primary residence out of your estate. Uh, but um, I'm guessing you're thinking about protections. You're thinking about um, asset protection from lawsuit and things like that. Well, I'd say you see different situations, and you know I've gotten feedback from clients and pushback, you know, on whether it should be a revocable or a living trust. What do you think about putting it in a living trust? The living trust is fine. Um, we do that all the time because the revocable living trust is still in the control of the person who created it, the grantor, and there is no inherent conflict with that person still living in that home, using it as his or her own. Um, so that's actually a very common strategy that we use, and we do that either to avoid probate or to just gather all the assets in one place. Um, we also sometimes do that to avoid will contests. You know, if we know that there are three kids and one of them has had a big falling out with the parents, we worry about a will contest in that situation, right? So, so there are several re reasons we would do the revocable trust, but the revocable living trust is not done for asset protection. That's the important thing to note. It does not shield you from creditors, and it also doesn't change your estate tax situation in any way. It's a great tool, but it doesn't help with every concern a client may have. I think a lot of a lot of people have a hard time with who do you name as executor. I mean, it's um, you know, it's it's a burden on that person, and uh, you want to have you want to have at least some expertise. And you know, a lot of people just choose their oldest son. Like, hey, Rye, you're the executor of my estate, by the way. <laughs> um, but what Not are your sure thoughts? Not sure that was the on... wisest decision, Bob. But you know, well, we you can know, talk about I'm that. Trusting, offline. I'm trusting my decision was was, was well founded. <laughs> but I'll be gone. I won't worry about it. Um, so what, what's your advice to people when they come in and say, hey, you know, who should I choose as my executor? It's always a toughie because it really depends on the situation. Like you said, most people default to their spouse and or children, the people who are in their family closest to them. So that's kind of the obvious place to go. Your, you know, next of kin, your closest relatives. But like you said, those people may not be equipped to handle the job. So that's a conversation we always have. It's a big conversation. What are the responsibilities of an executor? Um, I explain to my clients what the executor will actually have to do. And sometimes based on that description and that conversation, the client changes his or her mind saying, oh, you know, actually, I'm not sure I would want that. Um, you know, maybe we do want a professional in place. But the basic requirements are that an executor must be someone over the age of 18 um, who is just a competent adult, right? So it's a very low threshold. Now, there are some rules that could also be state-specific. Again, see, we have these state-specific things that crop up. So in New York, for example, uh, that person cannot be a foreigner. Or if they are a foreigner, they must act as co-executors with a New York resident. Okay, who's also a U.S. citizen. So in that way, the court places some limitations on us, but in other states, I haven't seen that same limitation. So it could just be any adult over the age of 18. And, you know, that's very broad, of course. So I think the criteria is to think about who would be good at organizing all the assets, uh, at uh, communicating with creditors, and also communicating and keeping peace with the beneficiaries because whoever is the executor will have to not only keep track of the finances of the estate but will also have to keep the beneficiaries updated will have to uh, make distributions 
And, you know, sometimes people assume that if they have two kids, it's best to have both kids in that position. But the flip side of it is those two kids are going to have to work very closely together and make decisions together. Mm. And even though it may seem equitable to give that responsibility to both children, it may also lead to a lot more infighting if they are locked and can't decide on things. So you're saying leave it to the oldest and the smartest. That makes sense to me. Whatever you say. <laughs> so it really is a complicated conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's something we spend a lot of time on with my clients. Not only, you know, how do we want assets divided, but who's going to be in charge of everything? I would say sometimes that takes even more time to figure out the various roles. Because it's not just the executor. We also have the agent and the power of attorney. Another big role with a huge responsibility and, frankly, a lot of access um, you know, many agents have gone rogue in the past, leading to all sorts of terrible results, you know, finances being left in shambles. So there are big decisions to be made in the department of who will do these things and how will they do them and what uh, types of um, boundaries do we place on them or what types of guidance do we give them to make sure that they carry out those roles in a responsible and fitting way. You know, something that I've seen, at least more recently with a lot of my wealthier clients and my friends is that, you know, there's a 50% divorce rate in this country. How much weight do you put into a state plan to protect your children, you know, from their spouse? Um, you know, you want to leave your assets to your children, but do you, do you suggest putting those into trust or do you just, you know, how do you, how, what are some of the steps you're taking, you know, to insulate your children from the potential divorce down the road? You know, just playing the odds, right? 50% is a, is a high number. It's something we worry about a lot, and it's something I bring up with every client, actually. Um, not to say that I tell them their kids will get divorced, but I bring up the possibility that leaving money outright to even an adult child uh, carries certain risks. So, you know, let's just take one step back. When we work with clients who have children, uh, we never recommend leaving money outright when the kids are minors, right? When the kids are minors, they can't inherit the money. In that situation, whether it's a will or a revocable trust, I will always talk to them about leaving the funds in trust for those children, and we talk about the rules of that trust and how it works. That conversation basically continues if the children are no longer minors. Even if my client has an 18-year-old, I will always say to them, let's consider safeguarding the funds by building in a trust. Now, if those kids are married, that conversation still continues, but now from a different angle, right? If you leave the money outright to your child, it may become marital property. And if that child ever ends yeah. up going through a divorce, and I hope they don't, but if they do, that money may get tied up and wasted in the divorce. So we always talk about the access to money as weighed against the protections because some clients do say well you know my kid is 40 if they want to waste it they can waste it it's their inheritance and that's certainly the client's choice but it's my job to educate them as to the options right and say yes you could certainly do that and no strings attached whatever happens happens or we can put the money into a trust and what the trust does is that it will leave it to the child, but whatever is left over typically will go to the grandchildren or further descendants. And that way, you know, if the child passes, it's not gonna go to the child's surviving spouse, um, which sometimes clients may want that. And again, those are the various options we play around. You know, I explain to them what could happen and I give them choices and, um, you know, sometimes, we want to leave those funds in the trust for the lifetime of the child, right? No matter how old that child becomes, we don't want the funds to be distributed outright. But other times my clients say, you know what, there comes a point where we just, I don't want the funds to be in trust. Let's say at 35 or 40, I want everything to go to my child. And of course, you know, I will follow my client's lead on that as long as I've explained the options to them, which I always do. And then it's their choice how they want to proceed. I guess the, the other difficult decision in that case is who do you choose as the trustees? Always. <laughs> That's why I said earlier that one of the biggest uh, you know, conversations we have is 
who do we name to these various roles? Um, because right. it's not just the executor, it's the executor, it's the trustee for the children's trust. Uh, it's also the guardian. That's one that really takes up a lot of time sometimes and bogs people down because they can't agree on who they would want as the guardian of their minor kids if something should happen to both of them. So sometimes yeah. I have to act as the mediator and yeah. sort of mediate between a husband and a wife um, about, you know, which set of parents or which, you know, uh, siblings should take that role. And, uh, you know, often I do give them valuable advice as far as the parameters of it, but it's always their choice in the end, of course. I think that clearly answers, you know, Ryan's first question, whether you should do this online, you know, or work with a, <laughs> yeah. you know, a certified super attorney like you. Um, I just want to get your last thoughts on, on, I put everything in trust and I have it set up. So I'm going to have a mausoleum with an ATM on the, on the outside and <laughs> Ryan has to come every day to get $200 out that way. I know he'll come visit me every day for the rest of his life. <laughs> Do you think that's a good idea? <laughs> I love it. I've never heard of that one, but I absolutely love it. I will have to suggest it to some of my more creative clients. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mariana, it was amazing to have you on today. Thanks for this great information. We'll put all your information uh, in the episode so anyone re can reach out. They can reach out. You know, we work with you. You do a great job. Pre prefer the fact that you're independent. Um, you give really great independent advice and uh, great to have you here today. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. I love the questions and this is a great format. So hopefully you'll have me back again. All right, it's the Hidden Facts of Finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, crypto fatigue has settled in. Prices have flatlined, trading volume has collapsed, and hardly anyone outside the industry seems to care about crypto anymore. Centralized exchanges like Coinbase and Binance are handling around $30 billion a day, less than half their levels a year ago, about 15% of the roughly 200 million billion daily trading volume when Bitcoin was flying high back in 2021. Sounds like the casino is uh, slowing down business. Yeah, it's really crushing my Bob coin. I'm very upset. Um, you know, I don't know what they're doing to us, but interest is going to skyrocket now that Sam Bankman Fried is on trial and you can find out how sophisticated an investor he was. Not. Um, <laughs> and I think the best thing is Michael Lewis, who's one of the best financial writers out there, Got to spend two years with this guy, uh, not knowing he was going to end up as the biggest fraudster in history. I can't wait till that book comes out. The movie will be even better. That's going to be so good. Talk about a plot twist. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I feel a little bit uh, cheated here because the tagline for Bob Coin is it never goes down. So I'm shocked. <laughs> you know, I feel like uh, that was a really misleading statement. Well, you know, Chris, uh, you, know, you know what you do when things are down? You change the name. It's now Robert Coin. <laughs> I love the one who's Bob Coin. I love even more as a Robert Coin, which is backed by the full faith and credit of Dad's hair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris. You may not realize it. This country has the world's largest oil reserves, bigger than Saudi Arabia, with some 17.5 percent of the world's supply. That's 303 billion barrels. It's Venezuela. Unfortunately, it's barely functioning uh, because of all the U.S. sanctions. But uh, I never knew that's where a lot of the oil in the world is. Sounds like a good time for a military queue, if you ask me. I think Venezuela is just another great example of how well socialism works. <laughs> Bob, we always knew you were a socialist at heart, you know? We, we, we never bought that fake capitalism uh, <laughs> attitude that you brought to the show. I got to correct you there, son. Free market capitalism, only way to go. There we go. That's a Bob Payne <laughs> line. All right, gentlemen. Well, great show. If you like our show, you love our show, Please, you can give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Leave a comment there. Tell everyone how great we are. If this is on Spotify right now, you can subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can like this episode. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and click that notification bell so you can be updated every week of all our new content. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.